Greetings, Kindred. I am Voivode Maquette, and welcome back to My World of Darkness with another episode of the Thicker Than Water recap here on Our World of Darkness. Uh, this is going to be episode four of the recap um, for season three, and um, we had an interesting night, to say the least. Uh, tonight's cast, I should say, um, consisted of Tinia, uh, Lorenzo, and Valentino. And, um, and Jay. <laughs> uh, so, interesting things happened. Uh, it was a very, um, close-knit grouping of, of a night. Uh, not, not much splitting off or anything like that. Um, but I'm very... <laughs> This was probably one of the better nights that we've had in a long time. So the story opens with a gathering of kindred at the last drop. The last drop is packed full of humans, but the back room is closed for a private party. And pretty much every anarch in the city is there. Including Vincent DePaul and Tyler. Patricia Bolenbrook, for those of you who know her real name. Now, the reason this is occurring, this gathering of, of anarchs, is because everyone was trying to catch up on why exactly the parking garage structure at the construction uh, project for the phlebotomy uh, hospital, which is now being, which is now, now just completely canceled, um, why it collapsed in on itself. And that was because the night before, Jay and Vincent DePaul and Valentino gathered together to collect some evidence of the situation that the kindred are finding themselves in now. Um, calling upon Jacob Monroff, Vincent DePaul is able to convince him to, if not himself, find another Nosferatu who is able just to just bring that building down completely. Uh, which not only destroyed whatever little evidence of supernatural happenings were occurring down there, but also made it so that the general public of Portland is not happy with the idea of that building being built without strict... Um, investigations and surveying of the land to find out why exactly it collapsed the way that it did. So at the last round, Jonathan Harker has already put up an enchantment on the back room where none of the music and noise from the actual club itself can get through the very thin doors and vice versa. None of the kindred conversation is going to get through. That is not in the books. I just made that up. I do have a... Uh, habit of just making up rituals on the spot <laughs> to make my storytelling easier. And I highly suggest all storytellers do that kind of thing. There's no reason why your NPCs don't have access to rituals that other, like, players don't. Um, all of the five uh, pieces of concrete that were collected from the parking garage are now light out on a blue tarp over the pool table uh much to the chagrin of miles trent who just tends to play pool most of the time while he's in there um the kindred are all looking at it trying to figure out exactly what could have scorched footprints like that into the concrete and as there was a lot of um uproar as Tinia was trying to figure out exactly what the hell happened last night. Why did that thing fall? Uh, we collected evidence now. Like, she wasn't there, and I don't know if she really expected the other kindred to do anything productive while she was gone. Or she might just have not seen the destruction as being productive. Um, as they're trying to figure out what exactly it is and understanding that it could be some kind of umbral spirit, uh, that, it, that it could be some kind of thing that came in past the Shadowlands uh, to come through. 
because Harker doesn't know what this is. And he's just doing all types of experiments trying to figure out exactly what it could be with Jay standing over his shoulder watching the entire thing. That is around the time when a voice from the corner of the room pops out as Lucas, a gangrel that I've used a few times. He's not very prominent in the story. He's just one of the city's background gangrel. Um, he's just playing pinball in the background, and he says over his shoulders, maybe you guys should talk to Ghost. Tinia says, come here and let's talk about this. Who is this? Where can I find him? All those standard questions. And he turns and goes, you, pointing over at Duke, the Toreador, uh, from the um, last, I guess, last year's at this point, uh, um, New Year's story with the hunters, and he's the one who had the Bruja, or he he's the one who had the ghoul who goes by Bruja online and has, like, witch YouTube stations. Um, tells him to come over and keep playing his game and don't lose, and if there's extra quarters, uh, quarters on, the, on the machine. Um, he wanders over and he tells them, oh, yeah, you can go uh, talk to talk to this uh, this homeless guy named ghost who seems to know a lot about these kind of things he's uh you know if any anything else you might want to talk to jake and, and this is what not the first mention of jake uh which is old jake the elder who is the elder gangrel of portland who's been here since the founding if not before the founding of the city um that is put to the side but the concept of talking to this ghost sounds interesting to everybody and what they end up doing is grabbing one of the plaques, which it takes a lot of potence to lift one of these things. They're just solid rebar enforced concrete. So they pick it up. They, they go over to this area, which is um, a made of cross street that I said. I said um, that, it, that he was over on 3rd and Powell, which is not too far from Last Drop because he's in Old Town, Portland which is also where I placed the last drop, right on the edge of Old Town Portland, because the last drop was the old location for the gallows in Portland where they, they did Old West Justice here. So they go down there, and they end up coming into the largest tent city in Portland. Now, I don't know... How many of you out there understand exactly the issue with Portland's homeless population is in real life, but it is really bad. And with it being one of the most expensive places in the United States to live, the need to take that horrific problem that is in real life and just make it a thousand times worse is really what World of Darkness is all about, where you you take the population and you double it, but you don't double the housing. You just make everything much more cramped and much more difficult to live in, highlighting how horrible these things are for these people. And as they're walking through, weaving in and out of the tents, they come to the alley where they can find ghosts. It seems to them, looking down the alley, that there's about two dozen people down here but as they're walking through the alley stepping on garbage because not even the trash is being picked up in this area anymore this has become a neighborhood that the city has just forgotten about and as they're walking over the trash piles and stepping on newspapers and working their way and since this is late november in game um working the way around sludge-filled snow piles. They eventually get down to where Ghost is. The scene is, is, is set where there's about, again, two dozen homeless people. There's a couple of trash barrels, metal trash cans that are uh, alight with fire keeping people warm. A large, clean, blue cooler full of sandwiches. And as the kindred work their way down there, the space just seems to be getting bigger and bigger and bigger, accommodating all these people comfortably, warming them, making sure that everybody is taken care of, that as well there's a feeling of peace in this area. But as they approach, this older man with gray hair 
wearing a hoodie over his uh, over his greasy gray locks, looks up with these milky white clouded over eyes and just looks around and says, what exactly are you for doing here? They try to start explaining what they're going on before he realizes that they're going to say things that might not fit well in personal company. So he tells the majority of the individuals who are in this alley to go and take a walk, which they do. Um, at one point in time, a, a woman does come in and and eyeing the cooler, he tells her just take what she needs. She's got kids to take care of them. So this, this ghost seems to be like the pillar of this community. The guy who keeps everybody together. They bring up the fact that in June, um, there was that situation that happened. And wanted to know if he noticed it. And he said, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, that was interesting. Uh, it took a lot to keep everybody calm here and to not notice exactly what was going on. So he was in the know on the situation. They explained where everything was going here, that there were tracks, that the portal was left open for months, and that right now they're trying to find out exactly what it was that may have come through. He laughs at them. And... They brought one of the slabs with a footprint. And he looks at it and he sniffs at it. And he says, I don't know what this is, but I can find out. But if I'm going to do this for you, you're going to do something for me. And there was this like, this look of deflation. Like you could tell all the players were like, ah, but uh, he just looks at them and goes, what? What's a little fetch quest? There's no reason not to do this kind of thing. You go out, you get the thing, you fight the dragon, you come back. We all meet at the tavern for some grog. And, you know, there were some chuckles between him and his two cronies that stuck by. And uh, Tinia goes, what do you want? Which is, what, what exactly do you want from us? And he goes, there's this guy. And Tinia's like, of course there's a guy. And he's like, just listen. There's this guy, and he has a thing. And he's at a place. I want you to go to this place and take the thing from that guy and bring it to me. Because he doesn't need to have it. Or like, do we get any details on this? And I was like, yeah, he's in a castle. And of course, like, the more he explains, the more frustrated they're getting. And he's like, well, can you give us some details on this one? And he's like, tell you what. You're not going to see this castle. And he looks over at one of his guys and he goes, Hey, hand me that cream of onion soup can you got over there. And he takes this old can and he's just like, <clears throat> just spits right into it and then starts reaching to his pockets and putting things. He picks up an old coffee stir and just starts mixing it up and it starts to foam and turn into this thick, gelatinous white liquid that, that's just just almost bubbling over the edges of the can at this point. And he goes, here, scrub, scrub this in the eyes and you'll be able to see exactly what's going on. Again, storyteller, I make shit up as I go. And uh, it's really funny, too, because as he's explaining, like, if you put this in your eyes, you'll be able to see the things that the this guy doesn't want you to see. Tinny is listening intently, but all the other ones, Jay, um, Valentino, Lorenzo... They've all got their hands on their... They've all got their fingers on their nose. And when Tinia turns around, she's like, are, are you serious? And, and um, they're like, what exactly is this thing that we're getting? And he's like, it's a whip. Just get this whip and bring it back. And they're like, okay, again, is there anything that you can tell us? He's like, ugh, don't touch anything. Don't use the whip. And uh, don't piss off the mage. I love the look of fear that just struck over their faces, specifically the look of fear on Tinia, because she was there the last time they kind of ran into a mage situation. For those of you who saw the what's, What Happens in Golconda Stays in Golconda episode of season two when they were in Chicago, um, 
where they ran into a young boy whose avatar was starting to like spark where everything that he believed was coming true but this isn't going to be the same kind of thing where they can just happen upon a solution where the idea of if you just convince him that magic doesn't exist it might expire the mage it might it might kill off the avatar so they now know that they're breaking into the sanctum of a mage to steal an enchanted object and ghost tells them that it's the the it, the tale's a relic it's actually a um preserved tale of a krenos ratkin and there's a whole lot of ex, ex, like there's a whole lot of explanation on what the hell a ratkin is but the idea that a were rat and they were just not happy with this situation so jay does something very interesting here as they're all talking and trying to figure out what the details are on on how to handle a situation like this jay closes his eyes and jay whispers into the wind asking for some type of idea of how to handle a dangerous situation like this and the wind whispers back because there are secrets to jay that not everybody knows yet. Jay whispers into the wind how to handle the situation, and the wind whispers, bargain. So, they all decide that they're going to meet at this location, at this castle. This castle in the middle of Portland that no one has ever seen before. So, they all get going and decide they're going to meet up there. Jay runs back to the last drop and steals another one of those concrete slabs, leaving the Anarchs now with three. Because Jay has one, which he has tucked under his shirt because he's strong. And Ghost has another one, which he's holding on to so he can find out exactly what put the prince there. They all meet back up at the castle, which in reality when they get there it's a gray stone building they get there and it's just a standard apartment there's a five foot tall red brick fence wall around the thing and a little tiny gate to get in and they're looking at it and it doesn't look special at all there's a couple of security cameras at the corner of the buildings and that's about it they look off to the right and there's like a block of buildings that go until the street turns and then there's more buildings and they look to the left and there's a block of buildings until they come to the street and then there's more after that. Tinny at this point just decides that if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And she grabs the coffee stir and adds it, uses it like an applique and just like smears this bubbling sludge over her eyes and she can't. It doesn't hurt, but she definitely does feel it like oozing and moving and working its way into her eyes. And when she's able to open her eyes and look up and see exactly what's going on, that quaint little brick wall is now a 10 to 12 foot tall cobblestone barrier. That gray stone building is now a massive castle with towers on the corners where the security cameras are, are now these large stone gargoyles with glowing purple eyes staring down at them and a symbol blazing bright on the door of this place that lets them know that this is not an ordinary place to be valentino and lorenzo they they finally snap out of it they decide you know what we're, we're necromancers the the ingredients that we use in our rituals are a lot worse than what's in this can and they just slather that stuff on their eyes and they see it too Jay, on the other hand, is just like not really feeling this. So what he ends up doing is he's he's got a set of minor uh, of a he's got a set of welding goggles and a welding cap. His, his the costuming on this character is ridiculous, but he's wearing like a weld he's wearing welding gear, and he just takes the sludge from the inside of the can and smears it over his goggles, and 
as a storyteller, first off, I just wanted to go, it didn't work. Now you can't see. But what I ended up doing was saying, you know what, fine. You're two traits down on all awareness based sight based tests while you're wearing those goggles and you see both you see the apartment and you see the castle so they stand around outside for a little while trying to decide how exactly they're going to do this are they going to go to the front door are they going to try to break it through a window like how how exactly does this work if a mage actually lives here isn't it dumb just to walk right up so I throw some dice and luckily I fail. Mage has no idea that they're there. So they all go to the back of the building where there's a small 15 foot wide, 15 foot deep little backyard behind this place, the same little brick wall. And Through the sludge in their eyes, they see this massive cobblestone wall. They also don't see the door, the little gate that leads into this little dead in the winter garden area. So they take some time and Jay does see that gate because he can see both sides. And after some doing, they're able to break it open, figure out exactly what's going on. But it's still jammed it's still locked so tinia ends up soaring leaping over the wall luckily misses either of the walls they would have seen valentino goes into tenebros avatar and slinks up the wall and down the other side lorenzo jumps soaring leap and Valentino just kind of like sticks to him. He is his shadow at that point. And then Lorenzo looks over and sees that the little garden door that's over there has a little padlock on it, just a little mundane padlock, and they're able to snap it, break it. Does fall to the ground, makes a little bit of noise, and I throw that dice again. At this point in time, the mage knows they're there. Those gargoyles have noticed him. What I have decided to do is roll 1d10 for each of those gargoyles. And unless I get one success, they don't notice. So I'm just rolling four dice. It took a little while, but eventually they did see them. The backyard was a very fun thing to run because as Jay saw that it was a dead, tiny backyard with a little bird feeder in the center and a couple little wooden benches that are all old and rotting away and covered in snow everybody also sees that this is massive magnificent garden with beautiful carved topiaries like something out of edward scissorhands with a massive statue of hermes in the very center of it in the in the center of a fountain they work their way up into the yard approaching the house Poor Jay, as he's in both worlds at the same time, as he's approaching, he's starting to feel like Lancelot and Holy Grail as he's approaching the castle, and he just seems to feel like he's getting further and further away with every step, but eventually he gets there. When they get up to the porch, there's this massive mosaic of a dragon and a knight. It's the story of Ziggert. The stained glass windows reflect the same story. When they get up there, again, there's a lot of arguing of what exactly do we do? How exactly do we go about this? The light that's being cast down on them as flickering sconces with open flames. While Jay sees a crappy little porch light that needs to have its light bulb changed out because it's flickering. Lorenzo just decides, screw it. Goes to check to see if the door is unlocked. And sure enough, the door is unlocked. They get in, and they are in this massive museum of a building with one long hallway that stretches off to the left and to the right. There's some paintings on the wall and some tables with little artifacts, little, little animal skeletons they can't quite recognize, daggers on stands, little statues, things like that. Tinia, at this point, decides, you know what? 
it's a maze. Let's just put our hand on the left wall and walk. So the outside wall while they're inside and they start walking and they just keep going and it keeps going and it keeps going until they finally come to a turn, but it's a left and a right turn. If they turn left, they should be in a different building at this point. If they turn right, it might make sense, but this, this building is just too long. They go down these hallways over and over again, sticking to the left until they finally realize they're walking down the exact same hall over and over and over again. They've passed that painting at least three times. They're trying to figure out exactly what to do. They actually even find the exit door. The door they came in through is right there behind them, not even three steps away. And they've been walking for at least 15 minutes. So Lorenzo decides that uh, I'll, I'll carve an, uh, an arrow into the wall and everybody freaks out of him. It's like, do not wreck the mage's house. There's a difference between breaking and entering and outright vandalizing the place. So Tinia ends up leaving a coin on the floor. He goes, okay, let's check to the right. And they walk right. And not even 10 feet down the aisle, they come to a turn left with a staircase going up and a staircase going down. They stand there for quite some time trying to figure out exactly what to do. And I'll have to admit, I had a good time with this one. They start heading up the stairs, and what they find is a little reading nook. There's a little table, a little couch that's kind of built into the wall. The wall above the couch is a little circlet of books. There's a book open on the table and a half-drank glass of wine. I have never seen people so afraid of a half-drank half glass of wine. I talked to Davica later on, who plays Jay, and he's like, my thought was, crap, somebody's going to come back for this. He must have just got up and gone to the bathroom. <laughs> so they finally gain enough courage to walk up the next flight of stairs, which they come to a little reading nook with a circular little couch along the wall and a little circle of books, half drank glass of wine, an open book. They get up there and they're like, we're walking into the same room again. I believe it was Tinia who decided to walk back downstairs and she came to the same room, except everybody else stayed upstairs and they weren't down there. They didn't really know what to do with this, but they went upstairs for a third time and found themselves on the ground floor. Tinny at that point ran downstairs from the ground floor and found herself coming back down to the ground floor again. They were getting so frustrated at this point. It was so much fun for me as a storyteller. I might even have to put this one up, like put the recording up so you guys can hear how this went because this was amazing. There was a lot of experimentation going on. Lorenzo was using uh, the binding fetter at this point so he could identify fetters and he realized that some of the books were fetters. He even, at one point, decided that he was going to go ahead and steal one. Threw a larceny check to make sure the others didn't see it, and he stole a book from this mage's sanctum. They started moving things around at this point, which was a lot of fun for me. They'd go up to that second that second landing with the second book nook, and, they'd, and Valentino closed the book, went back downstairs, it was still open. Went back upstairs, it was closed. Tinia moved the glass of wine from one side to the other, checked both sides, and realized that one had stayed and one had not. These weren't repeating rooms. They were different rooms, but identical. Valentino at one point actually checked to see what page the book was on. I said 42. So he opened the other one back up to 42. There was some joking about what this might be which I don't really want to get into. I will tell you what it was, but I want to explain what happened first. 
before we go into the details on how humorous the discussions ended up becoming. So they go up the stairs and they realize that there's this pattern where if they go up too many times, they just end up right back on the bottom floor. So they go up and they go up and they physically turn the corner and walk down and they walk down twice and they come to that reading nook. But across from the reading nook are two doors. They open up one and Lorenzo rushes through and finds himself back downstairs at the back door that they came in. He runs up and goes again. He goes through the other door. But there's a hallway that stretches from the left and the right. But where the door should be for the other door, it's not there. It's just a hallway. So they go. And they come around to the same situation again where there's another hallway and they go. There was a back and forth so many times until they were actually able to find an area that had a table in the center with these just spinning silver tops. With all this par paraphernalia on the wall, this very large set of wings in a glass case that were pinned up. Like somebody had pinned butterflies, but there's no way in hell these came from any kind of bird. And two doors with two symbols. A lore check told Lorenzo that it was Enochian. He couldn't read it. I wasn't going to give him that. And I also told them, out of character, that there's no way in hell you could look up Enochian online in this world we're playing in. So, they open one, and it's dark. And they go through it, and they're back downstairs again. The other one leads to a room that's identical to the one they were just in, but their friends are not in it. So again, it's another replica room. They go through that door. They choose the different, the other one. They go through that, and they finally get to where they're going. And I'm sorry, that was took forever to explain, but I was running them through the Konami code. <laughs> Up, up, down, down, left. <laughs> I had them do that. And the funny thing is, is before all of the frustration happened, the first couple of times that they were going up and down the stairs, they were like, I bet it's the Konami code. And they were laughing at each other, but it was. I was actually putting them through that. The mage at one point actually starts laughing at them and going, come on, guys, you can figure this out. And his voice just coming from everywhere at once. And he's like, tell you what, you guys figure this out and I'll even let you keep that book you stole, which earn Lorenzo some ugly looks. But they get in there. They walk into this final room, and it's just this large ballroom-sized museum with all these stands with glass cases, with all these relics inside of them. Vampire hunting kits. Skulls. Monkey... Uh, mummified monkeys, human hands with wicks coming out from in between the fingernails, things like that. And this individual that they end up meeting is just like, you know, I have been alive for 273 years and not once have I been burgled by canines. This is interesting. I'm having a lot of fun with this. So Tell me, what exactly are you doing? And he just clicks his finger and there's a couch behind them. And he goes, oh yeah, you guys don't get along because you're vampires. So he clicks and there's chairs. And he's like, do you guys want a beverage? And he gives them, you know, he talks to them for a couple of minutes. And, um, and Jay ends up downing this drink that he gives them. He gives them some goblets and fills them up with what he says is blood mead that his mentor got from his mentor who got from his mentor and it's from a, a Leon and like a thousand years ago I mean, there's some play for playful banter unfortunately Jay just just rockets that stuff back and the guy's like oh oh I really wanted you guys sober this is something to be enjoyed but you know calm down but the uh, the blood mead did take away a hunger point um, 
but to sober Jay back up, he gives him a an eyedropper full of this other blood from another decanter. Um, and this other blood is giant's blood, which just sobers him up instantly and makes it so that he has zero hunger whatsoever. Um, giant's blood is not something to play around with either. It's also not something that I would typically throw in a game like this, but I really wanted to make this a memorable occasion. So they actually do the smart thing and they explain everything to this mage. This mage who claims to be nearly 300 years old, but looks like he's in his like mid twenties. So he starts laughing and he is enjoying this entire interaction because this does not happen very often. So he explains, or they explain to him that they need this whip, and they're like, oh, the ghosts send you, and they're like, yeah, and it was, so obviously this this homeless guy and this mage have two rival, they have some kind of rivalry going on. So um, he says, you know what, since you were honest with me, and since this is such an, an interesting, momentous occasion, I will give you that whip under two conditions. One you give me something um, of interest, and Jay pulls out that concrete slab. He goes, oh, yes, I'm very interested in this. This is this could be fun. So the concrete slab, plus so you have to come back and tell me what it was that came out of that portal when you know what it is. Tinia agrees, shakes his hand, and she gets a little bit of a spark. Now, I'm not too mean, but he did put a small curse on Tinia. And when I say a small curse, probably one of the worst things I could possibly done. Um, but it was more of an insurance policy for him so that he knew that he wasn't giving up something for nothing. I gave Tinia effectively the Ravno Bane, the one where if you sleep in one place too many times, you burst into flames. Well, this one was if she knew the answer and did not come back and tell him, Within like 48 hours, she would burst into flames. Awful, mean thing to do, but at least I told Avalyn. I told Tinia's player exactly what it was and that she had an internal feeling of urgency that she needed to bring him that information. Now, the mage also let them know that when everything went to hell in June and every, the entire city was just plunged into the Shadowlands, he had performed a sleeping spell to make sure everyone slept through it. So that was the reason why there was not many reports on it and everything was well taken care of. Between Ghost and this mage, everything seemed to be fine. So he gives it to them. He pulls out this box with some strange scratch marks on it and opens it and pulls out the whip and hands it directly over and then says that he looks forward to hearing from them again with what exactly came over. So they take the whip and they take it back to... They take it back to Ghost. Now, things did not get any less strange at this point. On their way back to Ghost, they're just trying to wipe out their eyes and get all this stuff off, but it just wasn't happening. So they get back down there and they, again, they find Ghost and his two little lackeys at the end of the alley. And he is just surprised as hell that they even came back. He's like, wow, you guys lived. Um, he's like, I really did want this, but I really didn't think you were going to come back with it. Um, and they're like, do you have the answers? And he's like, no, but I can get the answers. Give me the whip. And they don't want to give it to him. And he's like, look, if I don't want you to have the answers, I just won't give you the answers. If I want the whip, I'll take the whip. You're going to give me the whip, and then I'm going to give you and then we're going to find out your answers. So reluctantly, Tinia gives up this whip, which is this like, it's a rat tail. It's a massive rat tail because it's a rat tail from a Krenos rat can <laughs> with a handle. And they're like, what would have happened if we had used that? And the only thing that he had said at first was, oh, if you had used it, you'd be in kind of similar troubles that you are in now. But what he tells them this time is that I'm glad nobody used it, because if you had, you effectively would have just become graffiti. There's this thing that Ratkin are known to do called Itchy Form. It is probably one of the most ridiculous things ever. Uh, and it works kind of like, if you guys are, Le are Legend of Zelda fans, A Link Between World, where you basically become part of the wall, 
and you are a cartoon character and you can go into a subsesh section of the umbra for that kind of thing well the whip doesn't go with you so if you go in you're just stuck there and they'd have to find a way out which could have led to a whole new adventure on top of that one which would have and it would have brought in a whole bunch of different things luckily however they were smart enough to not get into it that time so in exchange for what they said he does what he said he would do one of his little lackeys gets up and pulls a tarp over blocking the wall from everybody he starts doing this intricate shamanic ritual where the bricks start to rattle in the road and on the walls the trash starts to just overflow and boil up around them the smell is horrible there's roaches and rats and all types of bugs just crawling out everywhere but then they start noticing flowers growing in between the bricks moss growing where the grout is the sky is flashing between day and night rapidly Fa so fast that the kindred all though they're getting this this horrific feeling of oh god the sun's over me for even just a split second it doesn't have a chance for the beast to catch up and as they turn around feeling like there's something behind them they see this massive humanoid pile of garbage and refuse the two little lackeys of ghosts are on their hands and knees with their faces planted firmly in the trash in the ground. And, Gro and, and Ghost is on his knees with his hands up in the air saying, Oh, almighty trash heap, it is I, Ghost who sees between the worlds. Your loyal follower, I come to you for knowledge that only you shall have. So you disgusting pile of trash, tell me what I want to hear. And it starts to bellow with laughter, with just things crawling out of it and falling out of it. And it goes, yes, yes, my child, I love to hear your filth. As, it, as he just starts screaming profanity at this mound of trash. Rats pour out of it and just try to crawl underneath the concrete slab smashing and killing a bunch of them but the ones that come later just are able to use the dead bodies of their fallen and just squeeze underneath it and then, then like a living wave of just fur and muscle they just kind of pour it over to it and start building up like a pillar of living rats as it starts to build up closer to the almighty trash heap's face other rats coming in and eating the dead and clearing the path as it looks at it and is disgusted by what it sees and it tells Ghost that oh fuck oh also sorry before he actually did the ritual he reached into the po his pocket and he pulled out four necklaces made out of rat bones and and just random garbage with with butcher's twine and hands it to them so that they'll be safe in this area and so sorry i forgot about that part but uh it looks at it and it's just disgusted by what it sees and it tells them that like the dark one the, that a dark one has come and then i roll the dice to see what would happen with this but like the the rats disperse and the thing falls and just shatters into eight pieces and everything just goes back to normal they're back in the regular world now the almighty trash heap yeah, is gone <laughs> So, Ghost tells them that what they released from the Umbra itself, not from the Shadowlands, but deeper, where natural spirits live, was a bane. That this creature usually needs a host. Walked out through the Umbra, through the Shadowlands, into the mortal plane, and is now out there. And this thing has to be deliberate. This thing, this thing has to think. Most Banes don't, but the older ones can. This thing has to evolve. That they feed off human misery. That they feed off human bad intentions. And then when you stop and think about the fact 
of where it came from. This came from McCarthy's plantation grounds, where people were kept as slaves years after the emancipation, where Sabbat rituals were held on the regular. Sirt had a base near there where they were experimenting on things. All of the negative possible human emotions that this Bane could actually embody. They found out what it is. They said thank you. He told them in exchange they could just not hunt anywhere near him. They agreed. Snotty, snarky words were said back and forth, and they dispersed. Tinia still has about half a, a can left of that bubbly mucus stuff. I'm not sure if it's going to last. They technically still have the necklaces, too, that Ghost gave them to be able to interact with that totem spirit. That they interacted with. Ghost was a Bonar Theurge. He told them that he did hear about the situation that happened a while back ago where they had saved, at least Tinia and her little coterie had saved a werewolf that was stuck kept by hunters and then also the time in the woods where Tinia had been wrapped up by vines and then the werewolf showed its face and the vines just let go and she ran and he told her that it was nice to have a face for the story and that it was the magic users of their kind that were tying her up and the wolf that let them go because he decided that each one of them that helped save him that night would get one assist. And that was her one. They dispersed at that point, leaving Ghost alone in his kingdom of the homeless, his tent city of that he seems to be controlling, that he see, at least he seems to be able to guard over. And we're skipping a week I'm giving the players seven days worth of in-week actions that they can do. Tinia went back to the mage the next night and told him exactly what she had heard. That it was a bane that came through. And he relinquished the curse that he had put on her. That is what happened. It was a very interesting night, and it opens up a whole new world to them. They've never dealt with anything like this before. Banes. What exactly that means, how exactly I as a storyteller plan on running them. There's so many options. There's so many types of Banes. Anyway. I am Voivode Maquette. That is what happened at our last game night. And I cannot wait to see where it's going to go now that they know that there is a new enemy. That there's something that they need to look out for. There's a danger in the city that could cause some severe problems. I really wonder what they're going to be. Thank you for joining me. Good evening.